Yes. Okay. Morning, everyone. So today's lecture might be a little bit shorter, I hope, than yesterday's. We'll see. I might have time to go over some of the material that I didn't have uh, time to finish yesterday. If not, we've got a tutorial this evening, so we'll be able to get back some of the lost time there. So um, what I want to do uh, is sort of follow on from the discussion from yesterday and give you... So yesterday we were focusing, um, yesterday morning's lecture we focused, I sort of gave an overview, an introduction on how, uh, on, on a series of sort of quantum field theory effects, which essentially involve the production of photon pairs which get excited out of the vacuum state due to some various kinds of specific forms of what we've just generically called curved space time. And that curvature can result in, for example, um, a uniform movement. We looked at, uh, um, I also mentioned the case where you have a transonic flow, so from sub to super, uh, from subluminal to superluminal. Uh, we looked at the case when you have acceleration. And then I, I focused attention more on sort of the maths, giving some hand waving arguments as to why a time dependent, purely time dependent, no spatial dependence, a purely time dependent medium will, in the same way that a piece of glass reflects light, a time-dependent medium will create its own form of reflection, which essentially comes in the form of this beta or Gluboff parameter, which implies that there's amplification, okay? And we wrote down this, this relation, we found this relation that uh, links the output modes. So in standard scattering, you'd have R squared plus t squared equals one. This is when you have purely, uh, let's say, uh, spatial dependence. But if you have a purely temporal dependence, then you have, you have this other, actually can't use here. You have this, this slightly different relation, and you can see that this minus sign here implies amplification, because if I have to generate a mode with a beta different from zero, and in order for this difference to be equal to one, then I also have to increase the value of alpha. So my, the amplitude of my output mode is larger than my factor at the input. Okay, so, and then what we didn't go through was a specific example of how to realize uh, something like a medium which has a pure, a refractive index, which is pure only dependent on T. We'll find time to do that later on. What I want to talk to you about today is a situation where we have a refractive index profile of the form Z minus VT, okay? And as I mentioned yesterday, we briefly went through the maths behind this. The Gordon metric in this case can be recast into something that kind of looks like a Schwarzschild metric. Uh, if you go in the co-moving frame, implying that in the co-moving frame of this pulse that generates that refractive index profile, you have something which looks like black hole or white hole. And so we'll go through the details of that today and uh, sort of uh, look at what the implications are in terms of measuring Hawking radiation. So uh, if you're interested in this field, there's a very nice review called Analog Gravity by Barcelo Liberati and Matt Lissa. Uh, this is, I guess, is kind of the Bible at the moment for analog gravity. It contains essentially everything you need to know uh, about the field, okay? Um, and over the years, I mean, the field of analog gravity has essentially identified itself with the idea of measuring Hawking radiation, although, of course, as I, as I showed yesterday and as I'll also show tomorrow, there's a bit more to it than just, than just Hawking radiation. But that is the main focus at the moment of the field of analog gravity. Uh, you can find in contemporary physics, there's a short, much shorter review that I wrote a while back, which focuses uh, only on the optical analog. Okay? The, the optical analogs are by, me, by no means the only analogs. So I'll give a list later on of all the other systems that people are looking at. It wasn't even the first analog to be proposed. But there are a few people working uh, on these laser pulse analogs. Then this is what I'll be talking about today. And then there's also a book that we published uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, with chapters from, I'd say, most of the main sort of players and researchers uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Okay. 
Okay, so let's see if this runs. Just want you to. Do you remember when I said the similarities of the equations of general relativity and hydrodynamics suggest the existence of you hear that? Okay, so, so what, what the main idea behind oh, the main idea behind um, be, behind what Leonard was saying there. So are you all familiar with the Big Bang Theory? Okay. So the main idea that he was uh, trying to, to communicate there was I mean it's it's based on, on real science. It's exactly what we're trying to do here. And it is based on the original proposal by Bill Andrew from 1981, where he realized that in a flowing body of water, okay, you don't need anything fancy, in a flowing body of water, you, you can create an artificial horizon. And you'll see, whilst that might not seem too surprising, the, the real implication of this is that was the main focus point of, of Bill Andrew's paper. Uh, was that this horizon is not just a classical object, it can actually interact with the quantum vacuum, excite pairs out of the vacuum that have the same shape and form as, uh, as Hawking radiation from a real black hole. Okay? So what I want to do first is sort of just give a brief overview of, uh, of what this is all about, uh, just give some background material on, on black holes and Hawking radiation. Again, I'll go through some very hand-waving uh, derivations of how to get to the formula for Hawking radiation, not because it, it can't be found elsewhere and it, it can be done much more rigorously. I don't want to do the rigorous calculation. I want to do this hand-waving thing because as yesterday's example, I think, showed you that there's a lot of insight to be gained from just back-of-the-envelope calculations. Okay? So the, the, the main question is, you know, why, why analog gravity in the first place? You know, why bother with artificial black holes. And the point is that uh, I think everybody's convinced that black holes really do exist, but it is still legit to ask the question, is there any evidence of black holes? What experimental evidence do we have of a black hole? And it depends what now what you mean by experimental evidence. But if you, by experimental evidence, you mean I can see it and I can touch it, well, we have none. We only have indirect evidence, and we haven't actually even ever seen, really seen, a black hole yet. I mean, LIGO detected gravitational waves from what we believe is a black hole merger, but did we see those black holes? Okay. So that's the first problem. Uh, we do believe that there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy, uh, and this is based on uh, measurements that have been going on for more than 20 years. Uh, looking at the stellar orbits around Sagittarius A star, okay, it's a, a small a luminous object at the center of our, of our galaxy. And what they've seen is this sort of pictorial representation of the actual orbits of these stars. But the point is that these stars have orbits which, so from, from the shape, from the ellipticity of these orbits and the, the shape, you can derive, pull out what the mass of the central object must be. And if it wasn't a black hole, it would probably it would be larger than the size of the orbits themselves. And if you go through the maths and you look at what kind of object has to sit there and A, be invisible, because we can't see it, so there's nothing obviously luminous here. And or, that can also explain these orbits. The only object that we know about that can explain this is a black hole. And that's the most direct evidence we, we have at the moment. Uh, 
there are attempts at the moment to build uh, very large uh, radio antenna arrays that will give us, should give us enough angular resolution to obtain a direct image of this central region. And hopefully that's going to come, those uh, detectors are going to come online in the next several years. So hopefully soon we'll be able to directly see that, that black hole. Okay, so then there is scope and there is interest that that's, I think motivates the main interest for trying to build these objects, these, at least create these artificial horizons in a lab on Earth where we can really see them and we can try to do some physics with them. So the, the one, one way of looking at this, and you can go through some very complicated, uh, or let's say not, but more complicated maths to sort of derive how this works. Uh, the way I like looking at it is just by taking the, uh, the standard sort of Schwarzschild metric can be expressed in, in different ways. You can, Panleve and Goldstrand, re recast the, the space-time metric for a black hole in this form here, okay? And what I really like, uh, th this, this sort of metric here inspired what is called this uh, river model for black holes. And why? Because if you look here, you see this dr minus v dt. Well, what that is telling you essentially is that space is flowing like a river with a Galilean velocity v. Okay? And this term v is uh, essentially given by this formula here, which is the tell it's essentially telling you what the speed, it's essentially telling you that sp space is flowing inwards towards your gravitating object. Okay? So the reason why our feet stick to the ground is because we're being pulled inwards towards the center of, uh, center of Earth by this flow of space. In exactly the same way that if you were in a river which is flowing downhill, you would feel the water pulling on, on your feet and trying to drag you along. Okay? So and this speed here is a Galilean velocity, so it can uh, go faster than C. At this RS, this what is called the Schwarzschild radius, which is equal to this value here, then the speed equals the speed of flight, and that is your point of no return or where you have an event horizon. Yeah. Sorry? You, you, so I, I don't understand your question. Yeah. Yes. Yes. As, as in a black hole. I mean, this, this, so, the, yes, exactly. So this is the black hole metric. It's not me writing some fictitious metric. Uh, this Panlever goldstrand metric is the, take the standards um, Schwarzschild metric for a black hole, and you can just, re I mean, you can, re you can rewrite the, the, the metric for black hole in many different ways. There isn't just one way. Okay, so Schwarzschild was the first to come up with one way of writing it. Then after that, it was recast in different forms for, for many different reasons. And this is just that same metric rewritten like this. Okay? So this is, this is the metric of a, of, a, of a black hole. Okay, so and, and this is sort of, this model here is essentially, it can be considered as like the point of inspiration, the starting point for all analog models uh, of gravity. Because now you've essentially... If you, if you understand space, or if you think of space as something which is flowing, well, on Earth we've got plenty of things that flow, okay? And you can try, it, so that doesn't necessarily mean that as soon as you have something flowing you can create a black hole, but it's a good starting point. And then you need to try and see how to control that flow. Sometimes it will work, sometimes it won't, and that's where the whole trick of sort of building an analog gravity model comes into play. Um, so, the standard situation, what we're all familiar with, is, is sort of this kind of situation where I'm trying to show that you have this, this kind of singularity down here. You have space flowing inwards. You have this line here where the speed of the flow of space becomes equal to C, and this is where you have your horizon. So the speed is increasing as you, as you pull in. You can, of course, also have the time reverse. So the time, you can, you can flip T with minus T and still have the same same solution to the, the Einstein equations. In this case, you have uh, a flow, an outward flow with a decreasing speed as you move outwards. And in this case, we'll talk of a, about a white hole. Okay? Now, uh, in, we 
we are very well aware of mechanisms that will lead to astrophysical black holes just through stellar collapse. We are not aware of any sort of uh, astrophysical mechanisms that could lead to a white hole. Um, I mean, there have been some suggestions of how this could happen, but if it does, it's probably very rare. And because all of the mass, everything's been thrown outwards, they probably wouldn't be very long lived either. Uh, however, in the lab, it's actually often, the, the, the situation is reversed. It's usually easier to create a white hole than it is to create a black hole. But that's not, it's, that, that doesn't really change things because in both cases, I mean, one is just a time reverse of the other. Both will exhibit Hawking radiation, for example, with exactly the same temperature. So let's have a closer look at where this Hawking radiation uh, actually comes from. So uh, tomorrow, I'll be talking about Penrose superradiance, which is actually sort of the starting point for the whole idea that black holes could actually uh, emit energy. Penrose was looking at rotating black holes. This is in the late 60s. Uh, then Bekenstein in 73, uh, just from thermodynamic considerations, noticed that just a static, so a non-rotating black hole, uh, should have a finite temperature. And it wasn't clear at the time what the origin, the physical origin of that temperature was. And then in 74, Hawking gave uh, a description, quantum field de theory description, so essentially identical to what I laid out yesterday. So he calculated the beta squared coefficient for a black hole. So he assumed he had some incoming positive frequency mode, and he calculated the amplitudes of outgoing positive and negative frequency modes, found that they were different from zero, and concluded that therefore a static black hole will excite photon pairs out of the vacuum state. So Kappa will come to that uh, in the next slides. This is called, what is usually called the surface gravity of a black hole, and essentially it's the acceleration uh, around the horizon, okay? And uh, I mean, interestingly, so this, this surface clarity of the, the acceleration that you have on the horizon can tip, it will typically be extremely small, okay? So if you have a really big black hole, as you fall in through the horizon, you won't really notice anything because there's no, there's, you know, the tidal forces can be extremely weak. There's the, the, the curvature there doesn't necessarily have to be, be very strong. And what this in turn means is that this temperature can be extremely, extremely low which is our hero. So this is this cap is given by this formula here, and this essentially is just acceleration across the horizon. So what I want to do in the next slide is sort of give a very hand-waving derivation of, uh, of this formula. So the, the picture that then comes out of, uh, you know, how these pairs, photon pairs, uh, appear, um, so in the... This afternoon's tutorial, we'll go and have a look at Hawking's original paper, and we'll see that there he is talking about a time dependence in terms of the collapse of the black hole. Uh, but later, it was actually Hawking himself who gave, I believe, in an, a Scientific American article, who gave this kind of picture uh, where you just consider a static black hole, so nothing's changing in time. But you have, you have these sort of pairs you just have this quantum vacuum, which is broiling, or sort of pairs which continuously uh, come into existence and then disappear again. But close to the horizon, every now and again, one of the pairs, but one of the two photons, will get sucked into the black hole, and the other one will escape outwards. And these two will never be able to recombine, because this one will get sucked in and will never be able to come back out again. And so what you're detecting is this, the leftover photon from the pair that's being split at the horizon. Okay, and so the photon that escapes will say that this is sort of the positive frequency mode, the one with positive energy, and then one with negative norm or energy falls into the black hole, essentially impl implying that there's a loss of black hole, loss of energy in the black hole. Okay, there's a, so the black hole loses mass through this mechanism, or as Hawking put it, the, the black hole evaporates. And as I kind of, as I mentioned yesterday, one way of another way of looking at this, you know, remember this relation here, telling you that you have an amplification effect. So in essence, what we're saying here is that the event horizon is an amplifier, and the Hawking radiation 
is just simply the vacuum noise that has been amplified. Okay? And it's exactly the same way that if you go home and you've got your, your stereo amplifier and you don't give it any input and just crank up the volume, you'll hear crackling noise. And that's just you amplifying the thermal noise in the circuits in your, uh, it's not quantum noise, it's classical noise, but it's essentially the same kind of phenomenon. So we'll come to this. So that's this slide here. I don't give a number, but it's extremely small. So typical black holes, I mean, even the smallest black hole has to have, will have a mass, several, several solar masses, okay? So let's be optimistic. I mean, if you take... Uh, if you take a, a black hole with one solar mass, so a lot of it's already evaporated, and you, and you go through the numbers and calculate the temperature, you get something which is of the order of tens of nanokelvin. So it's tiny. And, and that's the problem. So you, the temperature does increase. So if you look at the formula, it depends inversely on the mass. Okay? So as, as it evaporates, the mass decreases, and the temperature increases. Gets, it gets hotter and hotter the energy of the emission keeps on increasing, so it loses mass even faster, and then decreases, and then it just, there's this runaway mechanism, okay? And indeed, the title of uh, Hawking's paper was Black Hole Explosions, okay? Now we believe that more than sort of a catastrophic explosion, uh, if this process does occur, it's more sort of like a big pop rather than, than a massive bang, but nevertheless, you have this runaway mechanism where the, the black hole keeps, the emission keeps on getting hotter and hotter, the loss of mass keeps on getting larger and larger and so on, okay? But for standard sort of uh, solar mass black holes, this temperature is tiny, and it's nine to 10 orders of magnitude cooler or uh, colder than the cosmic microwave background, okay? So you've got to look at, if you want to see this emission, and you face two problems with an astrophysical black hole. Uh, the first is you, you've got to distinguish it from this background, which is at, at three Kelvin, 2.73 Kelvin, and you're looking for something that has a temperature of, of a nanokelvin, that's not easy. And on top of that, most black holes are surrounded by, by other stuff. I mean, they're not these perfect static black holes sitting in the middle of nothing. Okay? They're sucking in uh, dust and, and, and plasma and whatever from surrounding, from surrounding stars. Okay? So all of this creates, creates a lot of uh, background noise. It's going to make any direct detection Hawking radiation from an astrophysical black hole extremely hard. Don't want to say impossible because you never know, but let's just go with extremely hard. And, and this is the reason why it makes sense to try and do this in the lab. Okay, so let's try and, I just want very hand waving maybe you've already seen this, this derivation. It can be found uh, on, around on the internet, I think. Let's try and sort of give a hand waving uh, description of how to derive the Hawking this Hawking temperature. So starting from basic first principles. Let's first have a look at the method I want to use in flat space time. Okay, so there's no black hole. Let's just start from the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, delta x times delta t equals h. And so that means I've got two particles uh, or photons or whatever uh, separated by some distance delta x. This is our flat space time. And in flat space time, let's assume that they're separated by a wavelength. This can be if they're particles, it can be the Compton wavelength, if they're photons, it's the wavelength of the photons. So plug that into here, that means my delta P would be of the order of H divided by lambda. Now if I take the energy, relativistic energy is delta P times C, then substituting that in, I get that my energy is H times mu. So I haven't found anything new, but what I have shown what this does imply is that uh, if the vacuum, in order to have an energy, you can read this the opposite way around, in order to actually detect a photon or a particle that has the energy of that photon or, or particle, well, then the vacuum fluctuations need to be separated at least by lambda, by a wavelength. Okay? If they're not separated by a wavelength, it doesn't really make sense to talk of these, these two photons or particles as being separate entities that have been excited out of the vacuum. Okay, let's apply the same reasoning now to the case where we have a curved space-time. Okay, so now the space-time is bent, and the problem I face, the first problem I face, if I go back to what I just did a second ago, is how do I define my delta x? How am I going to measure that distance in this curved space-time? 
Okay? And the answer, of course, depends. I mean, you can take the metric, or, but in general, it will depend on what the space time is. Okay? So let's pull in another ingredient uh, that's very specific to the case of black holes. As I said, I don't want to do any calculations. I'm not going to use the metric. What I am going to use is what is called the no hair theorem. Okay? So curiously, it's not. So what the no, no hair theorem says is that black holes can only be characterized by three quantities, charge, angular momentum, or spin, and mass, and nothing else. They can have no other, there's no other distinctive feature that allow you to tell one black hole from another, okay? Which if you think about it, it's weird. It's, it's, it's completely against sort of, uh, it, it, you, I mean, you might take it for granted, but it's not what you have, what you experience in everyday life. Usually by looking at something, you can tell, for example, how old it is. You know, if you look at the person sitting next to you, you can give a rough estimate of how old they are. If you look at a star from its color and its size, you can pull off how, you know, you can derive how old it is. You can't do that with a black hole. These are the only three quantities that you're allowed to know about a black hole, and this is why we talk about, you know, there's no hair, there's no distinct, there other distinctive features. It's not a theorem, by the way, because it, as far as I know, it can't be demonstrated, or it hasn't been demonstrated. Okay? It doesn't have some kind of logical proof that allows you from first principles to arrive at it. But this is sort of what comes out of, uh, comes out of the theory. Okay, so let's assume for the moment, let's not worry about charge or spin, because it just complicates the things without add, actually adding anything. Let's just, so let's take, uh, let's take a black hole that has no charge and no spin. This is the case that Hawking was considering. It just has a mass, and essentially the mass, uh, you can either think of this either in terms of the mass, or what we will need is a Schwarzschild radius. Okay, so you can replace mass, if you want, with radius of the black hole. That's the only quantity we're allowed to know, There's nothing else, the radius. Okay, well, that helps us how? Let's go back to our uncertainty relation, okay? And... Now I'm going to use the no hair theorem to claim, before I was claiming, I was saying, well, let's take delta x equals lambda. Now I'm going to say this delta x. There's only one quantity it can be equal to, because the no hair theorem it can only be equal to the Schwarzschild radius, and therefore 2gm over c squared. Okay, so as before, let's take our delta e is delta p times c. I plug that into here. Okay, so instead of delta p, I write uh, h bar over my Schwarzschild radius, and then here I'm just substituting in the value. What I also know, though, just from thermodynamics, is that this energy has to be of the order of Kb, that's a Boltzmann constant, times its temperature. So just by equating these two guys, I can pull out a temperature for my black hole. Okay? And this temperature is exactly the Hawking temperature up to factor 2 pi. It should be eight, an 8 pi at the denominator, okay? So that's just a numerical factor. You can try to be a little bit more evolved and say that maybe there's a 2 pi that drops in, pops in somewhere around here, but it's not important. It's these, it's, we found essentially just by using the no here theorem and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we pulled out a relation that links uh, thermodynamics with general relativity and quantum mechanics. I think that's, that's, uh, that's amazing. And, and the insight it gives you here is that these, these virtue, what, what's happening around the black hole is as if though you've kind of spread, made a hole in space time and spread it out so that your vacuum fluctuations now are sheared up to the sort of the size of the Schwarzschild radius. Okay? So they're ripped apart at wide horizon and emitted with a wavelength now. Remember the first example of that space time that I gave you? So if I want to see these photons, they have to be separated by their Compton wavelength or their, their, their wavelength. But in this case, in the case of the black hole, the only length I'm allowed to talk about is the Schwarzschild radius. So they're emitted with a wavelength that has to be of the order of the Schwarzschild radius. And, and that is essentially where this emission is coming from. No, no, it's a thermal temp. So you... you, you you, I mean, if you're looking at your, your black hole, you'll see this thing glow, just like a light bulb. 
or like a star. So the, 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 the emission will be a black body emission. So the emission will have, will have a shape like this, okay? And you'll have some maximum emission wavelength, which is given by roughly by this value here. And the temperature, which is you know, it's one over e to the h bar omega divided by kT minus one. Photons, right? So they travel at C. Exactly. So, so there's they, they don't have it, they can't have a distribution of velocities. So these are just photons which are emitted. Yes. Okay, so the energy distribution of the emitted photons follows a black body relation with a temperature given by what I was uh, by by this relation here. Okay, so, so the prediction basically is that you, you have a black hole, you expect it to be completely black, but it's not. It's, it's, it's glowing with this, with this temperature. The no hair theorem only works, it's only relevant to black holes. So this is, this is where it's this, this is the point where I pulled in the fact that I'm dealing with a black hole. If I'm not, then I have to take a step back and give a different answer to what is that delta x. And then I would get a different answer. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to our analogs. And the, so looking I'm pulling up again this sort of this panel of a Goldstrand metric. And as I mentioned earlier on, I mean, the idea is that once you understand or look at space, sort of hand, this hand waving picture of space flowing inwards towards the black hole, well, you know, as I said on Earth, and I'm showing an example of something obvious here, we, there are plenty of things that we can put in, into, into motion and make them flow. Okay? And the whole trick is in trying to recreate then this kind of metric. So one way to do this, for example, if you take a flowing body of water, and experiments have been done also by uh, Anru and Silke Weinfortner. They did a beautiful experiment, uh, following up also experiments by Germain, uh, Germain Rousseau, uh, where they just have a water, sort of a water tank. They're making the water flow down the tank. They put an obstacle like this underneath the, underneath the water so that the flow speed changes. It goes from slow speeds up and then slows down again. And here you have this, you can create a, what is called a transonic flow. So it goes from, we talk about sonic in the sense of sound waves, but actually, and that is what Anru proposed in his initial work in 1981. Uh, but what they, what people are doing now in experiments is they're sending surface waves or what are called gravity, not gravitational, gravity waves upstream. Okay, so the water's flowing this way. You'll have a little paddle here, which is moving backwards and forwards. It's creating little waves, and these waves propagate upstream. And they will be fine down here, where the, the speed of the, of the waves is faster than the flow, which is counter-propagating. So they'll propagate upstream. But here, the flow is going faster than the propagation speed of the waves. And what they'll do is they'll gradually move up and they'll pile up against this point here where the two speeds, propagation speed of the waves and the flow speed of the water become equal. This is where you have your horizon or what is called, what's called the blocking horizon. So the waves will not be able to penetrate beyond this point. Okay? And this is an analog of, of, a, of a white hole, of course, because the flow is going outwards and waves can't penetrate Inside. Okay. Now, if you go through the maths and you can show that the, the analogy is correct, you have the right kind of uh, metric, for example. So you can also pull out a temperature just by calculating. You can find the analog of a surface gravity for this flowing body of water. You can pull out a temperature, and for these systems, 
you, you find the number which is of the order of 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. Okay, so you've, sure, you've got a horizon in the lab, but now you've just gone and made things worse. I mean, you've gone from 10 to the nine, so tens of nano Kelvins from astrophysical black hole to pico Kelvins uh, in this case. Okay, and the trick is, I mean, the problem really lies not so much in, in the system itself, but in the fact that the surface gravity that we can generate without creating turbulence in this region here is actually rather weak. But nevertheless, I mean, what they did do is they, you, can, you can try stimulating. This is an amplifier, right? So as all amplifiers, I mean, you don't have to feed it with quantum noise. You can feed it with a wave and then look at how that wave scatters off the black hole and check that the amplification that you observe follows, for example, this relation. And that is what they did in the PRL case in 2010. Okay. So, yes. The, uh, you don't need a nonlinearity here. I mean, this is, this is, so you need a nonlinearity in the optical case. We'll come to that because you need to somehow create a flow in a piece of glass, which isn't easy unless you resort to some kind of optical nonlinearity. Here the flow is, is literally, it's, it's flowing water. So you just have this flowing body of water, and then the waves you send in, so you're not looking at quantum, you can't look at quantum fluctuation. And it, it just wouldn't make sense. Okay? So... So the analog of the fluctuation is it's these waves that you send in. So you've got a paddle, and you just send in waves. So it's all classical. And, and this is my point I was trying to point out here. Uh, this, this relation here is only telling you, it's just telling you that you have, there's nothing quantum in this. It's just telling you that you have an amplifier. So you, their idea was, rather than try to test the amplifier as an amplifier of quantum vacuum fluctuations, which you can't do here, let's test this amplifier with a classical input. So going back to the analogy with your stereo, now you plug in some music and you want to amplify the music. How does this amplify the equivalent of music or waves? So, and essentially that's what they did. They sent in waves with varying frequencies. Exactly, so what they do is they, 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 they fix their paddles, the, the, the oscillation frequency of their paddle, and so they fix the frequency of a wave they send in, and then they look at what they get out and measure. So they send in one mode. Remember, what we're looking for is a scattering process. So you come in with one mode, and you have two at the output. Okay, one will have positive frequency, one, the other will have negative, meaning that if you look at the waves, one will be going in one direction, the other will be going in the opposite direction. So you can pick those off. You just look from the top, and you just measure the amplitudes of these waves, and then you can pull out the amplitudes of the alpha and the beta. And then you repeat the measurement, for a different frequency. You change the paddle frequency, and you repeat. You measure the alphas and the betas, and then essentially you keep on doing this, and what you want to do is you want to verify that you, you get a relation between these two that uh, gives rise to sort of like a black body-like uh, dependence. Okay? And this is, this is what they were doing in their experiment. So you want it... Uh, they provided experimental evidence of a classical or stimulated analog of the Hawking effect. Now, it's actually much easier than that to create a horizon, uh, even at home. This is what is, in technical jargon, called uh, a hydraulic jump. Essentially, it's tap water. Okay, so you open the tap, you look at the bottom of the basin, and this is, I'm sure you've all noticed this pattern, okay? And so what is going on here, you can see that there's an inner region here, and then there's sort of this ring on the outside. So what is it, what, what's happening here? Well, what it, what's happening is as the water hits the bottom, it flows outwards, and it's flowing outwards. Here I wrote V greater than C. What I mean by C here is the speed of waves on the surface of the water here, okay? So you've got, you know, water is, I don't know, several millimeters thick. You can have waves in the surface of this water. There are waves propagating everywhere, but here the speed is faster than the speed of those waves. So the flow pushes the waves outwards, but then due to viscosity and friction with the bottom of the, the, the tub, 
the way the, the speed slows down, and this ring corresponds to the point at which the flow speed becomes equal to the speed of the waves. And this is then why you see a hump here, because all the waves on the outside will propagating inwards will, will tend to accumulate around here. Okay? And so that's, the, I guess, I think that's the easiest possible way to, uh, to create a white hole for us. And so these horizons, I mean, it's, it wasn't until people really started looking into the physics, this, they're all over the place. I'm going to show you more examples. Now, when, you, when you go out there and uh, it's really just look at, what, look at flowing water and you'll see, literally see these horizons and start to see them on a daily basis. So this is an actual picture uh, that I took uh, in a sink just to prove the point again. Okay? Another example. So this is a, a whale. It's just flipped its tail underwater. Okay? So from underneath the water, I'm looking from a side view, this is the, the whale, and it's, it's created sort of a flow of water upwards, and then this flows outwards like this when it reaches the surface. Okay? So here, we're cre it's creating a flow which is faster than the speed at which waves can propagate, and it therefore creates this region here where you can see there are no ripples anymore. There are no waves. I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, why are there no waves? I mean, you can do this even in the swimming pool. You just push your hand up and you see there's a swimming pool. Go, go try. Just push water up and you'll see, you'll see this ring appear. Okay? Why, why does that ring appear? Because you're creating this flow which is faster than the, than the propagation speed of all these wavelets over here. And you can see them accumulating. They're trying to get in, but they can't because you formed this white hole for us. So it's, it, it's very simple physics and you know, very, very common day stuff. So <clears throat> another thing I wanted to point out, this is another sort of curiosity, and again, something that you can easily observe in nature, is um, related to how sort of the light cone and how, how light is modified as you go from far away from the horizon and you start to fall inwards. Okay? So often you'll find in textbooks this sort of uh, diagram where you have this Minkowski cone. This is the light cone. Okay? This light cone here contains all your future events, okay, the Minkowski diagram. And as you move in towards the black hole, it becomes tighter and tighter, and it starts to tip. Okay? And the, at the horizon, it tips all the way over so that your future, all of your future events, lie, can only lie inside the black hole. This is just another way of saying that your future does not contain any paths that allow you to get outside, and so you have to fall inwards. Sorry? This is, so yes, yeah, so this is the, your trajectory as you fall in, as you fall into the black hole. Yes, it's not very precise what I was going to point out here. I agree. So that, that line should have been passing sort of through there. I agree. Okay. Now, what we can also ask ourselves is what happens to a frequency of a wave as, as, we, as we do this, as we fall into the black hole. And this is just, you know, just have a Doppler. As, as you're moving along, the speed is increasing. So this is the flow speed at which you're moving, and that will Doppler shift the frequency of your wave. And as, because you have V equals C here, as you go across the horizon, your omega prime is going to go to zero. You're going to have a wave. The waves are going to have zero frequency. And so what does that mean? What does a wave with zero frequency mean? Let me show you uh, a video of, oh, this is just flowing water. This is a wave with zero frequency, okay? You can see what's happening here is there's water, this is very deep water, it's hitting a submerged wall. There's about that much water on top. And this is creating a very sharp change in the flow speed, okay? And it's exciting, this wave. But this wave, I don't know if you noticed, let me run it again. It has a k vector. It has a wavelength. OK? It has a wavelength, so it's definitely a wave. Up, down, up, down, up, down. But it's not oscillating. OK? That's just, and that is a zero frequency wave. And actually, that, I believe there was actually a, a horizon being formed here. Sorry?
So there's, there's just water which is flowing over this, this obstacle. So here it's flat and here it's flat. Yeah. Oh, so, so you meant that, so this is, essentially it was, um, the setting was, um, this is like a small dam. So there was, the, 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 it, this was Scotland and we get a lot of water. So it had flooded and so the water had risen above this wall and it was flowing over the wall. So it was, it was a flat surface, okay? So it's a very similar setting, you know, that, that cartoon that I drew of Silke Weinfurtner's uh, experiment where she put sort of a, an obstacle underneath the flow to, to change the speed. Well, this was sort of like just a naturally occurring situation where I had very deep water which wasn't flowing and then there's, it was trying to flow over, over the, this flat wall. And so I believe there was a horizon here and it was creating this, what people now call undulations. So this is a zero frequency wave which is triggered by the formation of this horizon and the, the change in flow speed as water moves across the, the wall. Okay. So this is just to sort of point out that uh, it may sound exotic, but actually it's uh, something you can see if you look around and pay attention, you'll see this stuff all over the place. If you go to the seaside and you, you see a look, look at rivers as they flow inwards, okay, as the river flows in, if you look from the top, I don't know, I'm not sure I can draw this, but looking from the top, this is the river coming in, you're, and there are waves from the sea coming inwards, you'll see there'll be a region here where there won't be any waves, okay? Again, you'll, you'll see sort of like there'll be like a white hole horizon also in this region here. They're all over the place. Okay, so let's look more specifically what happens in, in the research lab. Uh, what kinds of systems have people looked at well, there's a whole range. I hope I have all of them. I might not even have, have all of them. I, the, the first one proposed by Anru was sound waves propagating in, uh, in a moving fluid. Uh, we've spoke quite a bit about gravity waves in, in water. Okay, So you can look at the works by Rousseau, Leonhardt, but also these, uh, these recent papers uh, in PRL, actually by, by Anru and Weinfurtner. Uh, very recently, I'll give some references at the end to this. Uh, a lot of very interesting work has been performed by Jeff Steinhauer uh, looking at phonon oscillations in Bose-Einstein condensates. Okay, he's published two papers in nature, both in nature physics over the past two years uh, showing evidence of Hawking-like emission from, from BCs. Okay? Uh, Waveguide systems have been proposed, again, by Andrew and by Leonhardt. Uh, People are looking now at polar exciton polaritons, okay, in semiconductor cavities. One of the first proposals was to use liquid helium, okay. This goes back to the sort of gravity waves in water. Remember I was saying the, the, the temperatures there of the order of picokelvin or nanokelvin, how to actually go and see those. Well, the hope was that you could maybe increase the temperature a little bit and then go to liquid helium at a few kelvin and maybe have some hope of seeing something there. I'm don't, not sure, so there's a lot of work by Volovic on this, but I'm not sure if anybody's still working on these things. Then you've got squid uh, arrays. People are talking about squids. Yes, they can create an array of these. So something similar to waveguide system, you can have a perturbation which moves along the waveguide and creates a, a horizon. And then what I'll be talking about now is light in refractive index. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, the first paper to sort of propose this as a material, so light in a fiber, propagating down a fiber, uh, goes back to this 2008 paper by Dwarf Leon. Okay, I think I can skip this bit because we, we've already seen this. But essentially, so just summarizing what I was saying yesterday, the idea here is that, so what you're looking at here is a picture of the lab I've got a laser pulse which is shooting uh, in this direction here. We weren't working in a fiber, we were working in free space using what are called filaments of light. So the, the, the effects of nonlinearity can counterbalance uh, diffraction and you have these sort of like soliton-like bullets which propagate over very long distances without, uh, without diffraction or dispersion. And those are the kind of pulses that we want to use to create analogs for, uh, for artificial black. 
Okay. So again, the idea is that so you've got this black hole with this uh, flow speed, you have your white hole. How does that translate into the case when um, move on? How does that translate into the case when you have an optical pulse? Well, what you need to do, remember what I was saying yesterday when I briefly went over sort of the basics of this model, you need to work that the horizons are formed, where you need to look at these horizons is in the co-moving mechanism. Okay? Remember that the Hawking's model was for a static black hole. It wasn't for something that was whizzing past at the speed of light. You need to put yourself, so this is sort of representation, that this is supposed to be my, my pulse, my, my laser pulse, which is moving along at the speed of light. I'm going to sit here. And if I look at the speed, because the refractive index is increasing, remember, we, the nonlinearity gives rise to a relation like this. Okay, so you have your background refractive index. If it's glass, that'd be 1.5. And then you have, this gives rise to a delta n, which depends on the intensity profile. And the intensity profile would typically be something like this. So far away, you'll have n0, and then here you'll have some n0 plus delta n max, and then in the middle here it's increasing and then decreasing. Okay? So what that means is that the speed of light is also changing. Remember, I'm sitting in the frame of, uh, of the laser pulse, so the speed of light is also changing as I, as I change position inside my laser pulse. Okay? Over here, it's just... C divided by N0, but then over here, it's C divided by N0 plus delta N max, okay? So it's going to be slower. And so this is the velocity profile of light as seen in the reference frame of my moving pulse. And so you can see that I've created, I'm, I'm changing the speed at which light propagates through the mean. So that you can do two things. You can either change, as in the water experiment, you can change the speed of the flow, and have a constant speed for the waves, and where the two intersect, you have a horizon. Or you can have a constant flow, this V here, and then I can change the speed of light. And again, where the two intersect, I have a horizon. Okay? Okay. So that, that's the basic idea. Now, it turns out, so as I said earlier on, you know, it's not sufficient to just create some flow of any kind and then say, I have a horizon. You have to be careful. If you want to claim that you have a horizon, you want to use that to mimic a black hole, you need to make sure that you, have, that you actually really have generated the right kind of space-time metric. And it just uh, it turns out, and you can go through the calculations, and if you do so in this paper here, PRD from 2011, you can show that the space-time metric generated by this guy here has exactly the form of the panel of a Goldstrand metric, okay? As do all those other, I gave you that list of analogs, as do all of those analogs, okay? They can all be reduced to a metric of this form here. Now, what changes from one analog to the other, of course, is going to be the nature of, of the flow speed, okay? So it's not 2GM over R, or the square root of 2GM over R anymore, of course, because I don't have a mass, it's not a real black hole. What I do have is the speed of my light pulse and I have the refractive index of the, of the material, okay? So this is what gives me the effective flow speed in my, uh, in my, in my material in the co-moving frame. See these primed coordinates here mean that I'm in the co-moving frame of the laser pulse. Okay, so this is kind of what it looks like. If I imagine a 1D situation, I have this flow which is changing speed, and I have the pulse which is moving this direction. So on the leading edge, I have a black hole, so everything sort of gets sucked in, and on the trailing edge, I have a white hole. Everything gets pushed back out. And <clears throat> similarly, I mean, what you then need to check is that, and this is, you go through the details of this, again, this PRD paper, you need to really then go and check not only that you have a horizon, but similarly to what Van Roo did in his 1981 paper, you've got a horizon, you need to check how this interacts with the quantum field fluctuations, okay? And the way to do that is just to follow, and we'll give an example, you just need to follow the recipe that I gave yesterday, okay? You've got your space-time structure or the equation, your evolution equation that describes how light evolves in this system. 
you take an input, positive frequency mode, at minus infinity, you propagate it through, you take the output modes at plus infinity, project them onto this sum of alphas and betas, so the positive and negative frequency modes, and check that you do indeed have a beta greater than one. That means that you have amplification. In order to prove that you have Hawking radiation, now you have to do an additional step. You have to check that, that's, that the shape of that beta that, or the alpha, the ratio between the alphas and betas does actually give rise to uh, a black body emission, okay? So essentially that means that the ratio between alpha and beta has to be equal to a negative exponential. And, in, and if you do that, in this case here, I'm not going to go through all the maths, but if you do that, you do actually find the equivalent, the analog of, uh, of a surface gravity, which is now, and intuitively this makes sense, it's given by the gradient of the refractive index. So the dn and dx, this is the gradient of the refractive index across the horizon. Okay? So the higher the gradient, then the higher the surface temperature, and therefore the higher the temperature will be. So the higher the surface gravity and the higher the Hawking temperature will be. Okay? So this is how Hawking's formulas translate into the case of this uh, optical analog. So let's have a little bit more detail. Again, I'm going to sort of whiz through the calculations. If you're more, if you're interested in this, I mean, please go and look at the PRD paper. Uh, but in general, I mean, if you look up at the works by Belgiorno Cacciatore over the past few years, they've been working with different kinds of models to derive this in different, uh, in different ways. But you have to you essentially just do what I was, again, I'll repeat. You take a positive frequency mode, you stick it into your, this is just the wave equation. There's a squared missing here. But this is just the wave equation that we were describing yesterday. I think nothing's changed. And I just need to evolve this. Now, it turns out that I can, you can either do this numerically, and we have, but you can also, and I'll show a numerical simulation uh, at, uh, in a few more slides. But there is, you can also perform what's called the WKB approximation. You can sort of give an analytical, sort of approach this analytically. So we can change coordinates into a forward and backwards. We define this forward and backward propagating coordinates. And what you find is that the solution for the phase here has, is a function of this form here. We have this integral. And essentially, we just take, we're just interested in the one with the minus sign because we only have positive refractive indices. Because if you look at it, if you take the one with the minus sign, you can see that you have a divergence here. Okay? And it's this divergence which corresponds precisely to our, to our horizon condition. In other words, what it's telling you is that the phase of your wave as you approach the horizon, okay, so the condition for which this goes to zero, starts to diverge towards infinity. You have this, what Unruhoff sometimes calls this phase tearing effect as you approach the horizon. Okay? And interestingly, what you observe, what you find is that this integral here is approximately equal to a logarithm. Of, uh, of your coordinate, which is precisely the same kind of, if you go, we will, uh, during the tutorial today, if you go and look at Hawking's derivation, he speaks of these mentions that there's this logarithmic divergence of the phase as you approach the, the horizon. So all the correct dependencies are, are, are in there. Okay? So then what you do is, so you put in, you, you, you want to write your output modes uh, as a function of these alpha and beta coefficients, and when you do that, you essentially find, remember, the beta coefficient is what essentially determines the average expectation value of your photon number. You find this relation. You, you find a relation. Uh, now, I skipped a step here, because actually this is not what you find. What you find is that you, you find 1 over e to the sum coefficient minus 1. Okay? And this is also what Hawking found. And I think an interesting quirk of this calculation is that all the way up to here, actually, there's nothing quantum involved at all. The quantum, if you want to identify something as being quantum by the presence or not of an h-bar in your formulas, then h-bar never appears up until this point. And it only appears at this point because Hawking and everyone else decides that the constant that appears here, they say, well, you know what? So we're just going to call that h bar omega divided by kt. Okay, so 
that's food for thought. You know, when people ask, is the Hawking effect quantum or not? I think there are different answers to this question. It's definitely quantum in the sense that the, 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 the input condition, when you're looking for pure, the, the real sort of Hawking in terms of like a black, a spontaneous black body emission, then sure, it's quantum, but only in as much as the input condition was a quantum fluctuation. But the amplifier itself, the amplification mechanism, the physics behind that is classical. At no point until here did H bar enter that formula. So this relation here can describe a quantum amplifier, but also describes a classical. Okay? So I, I would claim that a black hole actually is a classical amplifier, if you, and then it depends what you give it as an input state. If you give it a quantum fluctuation, then it becomes a quantum amplifier, and it will give rise to light amplified from the quantum state. But otherwise, I mean, if you think back to what I said earlier on, uh, in terms of the, the experiments that Unruh and Weinfurtner did with water waves, there's nothing quantum in there. Okay? They were just sending in a wave, and that wave, sure enough, got amplified. So there's nothing quantum in that, and yet it worked. Uh, this equation here. Uh, so again, it's just what it means is that I should expect to see if I create this delta n moving at the speed of light or c over n in my material, and let's assume for a moment there's no other uh, emission process, then I should see this material emit a black body radiation with this temperature. So I should see light coming out of this. And that light will look like a light bulb. If you want to approximate light bulb, this is a black body. Uh, but let me use that word uh, with this temperature. So it's not a zero temperature system. Uh, well, OK. So uh, I, no. Um, I say no, but that's then what we went and measured. So this should be, I mean, what we're talking about here, everything is 1D. And the, the whole analogy works, even if you're in 3D, the, the, you, you, just by the fact that you've got a pulse which is moving in a certain direction, it's not expanding in 3D, it's moving along a certain axis. That breaks the symmetry, and it means it, it works in 1D along the axis of propagation. So what I should do is I should look at the pulse coming towards me, and then that's where I'll see this, this black body glow with this temperature T. Now, I'll come, back to that in a, I'll come back to this in a moment. What we actually did, though, is we looked from the sides. And what we were looking for, so we, we tried looking head on. But of course, you're blinded by the pulse itself. You, know, you, you try to put a camera or something there to detect this radiation. You're, you're just blinded by the pulse. And you can put in all the filters you want. But if you have, and if you think in terms of numbers, if you, you, you a typical light pulse will have, what, 10 to the 15 photons? And then here, if you go through the numbers, you're, that's 10 to the 15 photons per pulse. If you go through the numbers here, you, you, if you're lucky, you might expect to see 10 to the minus 2 photons per pulse. What that means is, of course, you, see, you only see one photon every, or one photon pair every 100 pulses. So you have to distinguish one out of 10 to the 17. Now, you can do all the filtering you want, but that's close to impossible. So what we tried to do instead was look at 90 degrees, hoping that some of these photons would be scattered at an angle. And then we'd be able to detect those, also based on the idea that this emission wouldn't be you know, sort of like in a collimated beam, but would have some angular spread. 1D. 1D. Can you measure H bar? Uh, oh, wow. Uh, I, I'd say no, not to any reasonable precision. I mean, it's a miracle if you measure any photons at all. So I don't think that's a good starting point to then go and try to look for uh, 
I, this is really a struggle. I mean, the, the, let, so let me be very sort of open here. This optical model hasn't yet led to, I mean, we, we published a paper where we claimed we'd seen something which we believe to be Hawking radiation, and I'll show you why, but it hasn't led to sort of the, 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 the smoking gun um, that one would really like to see as a measurement of quantum correlations. So show that you can actually measure the alpha and beta particles, you can actually measure the positive, frequency, the positive and negative frequency modes and show that they're, they're correlated at a quantum level. And we weren't able to do that. So it, it's, and, and again, it comes down to the fact that it's just, you know, you've got this 10 to the 15 photon background and you're looking for one in 100, you might say. It's, it's very hard. So we have this condition here. The horizon will be somewhere here between those two values. In other words, what I'm saying is the horizon will be somewhere between here and here. Oops. Okay. So what I need to do is, in order for that to happen, if this red line here is sort of the speed of light in my material, here I'm assuming, for simplicity, that there is no uh, dispersion. Okay, So all frequencies, all wavelengths have exactly the same phase velocity. Let's assume it's this red line here. Well, then what I want to do is I want to tailor the speed of my laser pulse, which I can do. Um, with various, uh, various mechanisms, but if I'm not, uh, I can tailor it, for example, in a fiber by changing the, the, the mode size or, or the shape of the mode. Um, what I want to do is I want to tailor the pulse so that at minus infinity, so far away from the pulse, the speed corresponds to this value here, and at the peak of the pulse, the speed corresponds to this value here. And then I know that any other waves propagating in the material will, in this case, encounter, for example, the horizon roughly around here. Okay? So this is what happens when there's no dispersion, but of course all materials have dispersion. So how does this, fit, how does this picture get modified? So this is a case where all frequencies see exactly the same thing as they would in an astrophysical black hole. Okay? And this is the situation where, because all frequencies see exactly the same thing, this is also where you would observe sort of this perfect uh, black body-like radiation. But the reality is slightly different. I mean, in the material, real material, you have dispersion, okay? So now C over N naught has this kind of behavior. This is actual behavior, sort of a calculated curve from uh, a lead, lead doped glass. And so my C over N zero plus delta N, where now I'm just taking delta N to be some constant 10 to the minus three, then you have this other curve, okay? And this is the speed uh, for example, at which your, your pulse is moving. And so you see you only have now, this thing actually does become an interval. Okay? There are only certain wavelengths that will be able to see a, a, an horizon. And worse than that, or in addition to that, if you want, each different frequency will see a horizon at a different point. So for example, in this graph here, we have zero, so 560 nanometers will see a horizon right at the peak. And what's the other wavelength there? Roughly 400 nanometers will see a horizon down here. And all the other wavelengths will see horizons in different positions. Okay? But remember the temperature that I was, the, the, our formula for the temperature, okay, was proportional to the gradient of the refractive index. But now every frequent, no, so now not only do not all frequencies have a horizon, but the different frequencies have horizons at different points where you have different gradients. Okay? So what that immediately means is that if, if you're going to give me a definition of Hawking radiation as being spontaneous emission from a horizon that has a black body dependence period, and you're going to be strict about that, then you cannot observe Hawking radiation from any kind of dispersive medium okay? because of this problem. Now, and, and there was a lot of debate in the community about this. I think things now have evolved and people are a bit more relaxed. They realize that Hawking radiation actually is, is it's a bit broader than that. And if you're just interested in the physics, you're saying, well, is the physics the same? Well, yes, it's just the output that's quite different. Okay? And you can build that into the model and you can predict exactly what the output, uh, the output should look like. So 
essentially what this means then is that, coming back to your question, what should I be looking for? I should be looking for an emission that, let's forget the black body dependence, because that's not going to happen, but we should be able now to say, to identify Hawking emission, at least in this model, just by simply looking at the wavelength range over which I see a spontaneous generation of light. Okay, so I send in a light pulse, and I know I can measure the speed at which it's moving, and depending on the speed, you can see if I, if I move the speed around, up and down, then this interval is also going to move around. Okay? So if I know how to control the speed of my light pulse, and I do that, and as I change, as I crank up the speed, I see a spontaneous emission of light which follows exactly this window and moves around in the predicted way, well, that is what we at the time considered to be the smoking gun for evidence of Hawking light emission from this system. So this is what the setup looked like. It was super easy, okay? Um, I just, just had an input laser. This is just a femtosecond, 100 femtosecond uh, laser pulse just being focused into the sample with an axicon. I'll come back to that in a second, why an axicon. I don't think I don't have a slide for that, but I'll explain why an axicon. Here we had the sample, which is just a piece of lead-doped glass. We spent say years, uh, looking for the right piece of glass. I mean, glass, there's, there's, there's thousands of different kinds of glasses, and most of them give off very strong uh, fluorescence when you hit them hard with a laser pulse, okay? And we wanted, uh, we don't want to, we're looking for spontaneous emission, and fluorescence is also spontaneous emission. And so how do you then distinguish the fluorescence from, uh, from your Hawking radiation? So we were looking for, we, uh, our search here was essentially we were looking for a piece of glass that uh, A, had very well-known fluorescence uh, emission, so very well studied and very well characterized, and at the same time also uh, had emission in regions which are far away from the region where we were predicting to have Hawking emission. And it took a while to, to find this, this right combination uh, of conditions. Okay, and then we, as I said, we couldn't look uh, head on because we were just blinded by the laser pulse itself. And so we were hoping to see some of this light scattered at 90 degrees. Okay, so why, why an axicon? So, first of all, what is an axicon? So, a standard lens just has a parabolic or spherical-like profile, okay, and the focus your Gaussian beam, your Gaussian spot. An axicon is just a different kind of lens, which imparts, instead of imparting a quadratic phase onto your beam, so if you come in with a plane wave and you hit a lens, this will give you sort of a quadratic profile, which means that you'll focus, focus in. This axicon, when you come in here, okay, it's giving... This is linear, okay? So it's, imagine it's, it's just like a, a cone, okay? That's just a cone of glass. And <clears throat> along this axis here, what it will do is instead of giving you a parabolic phase, it will give you a linear phase. So your wave fronts will be bent like this and be coming in this, this direction here, okay? Now, if you look at what, what you generate as these plane waves intersect on the axis here, okay? It's, it's easy, again, sort of hand-waving math, what happens here. Well, if I have just two plane waves, these will overlap here, and the transverse pattern will just be a sine wave, okay? But I have cylindrical symmetry here. So in cylindrical symmetry, the analog of that, if you just go through the math, you don't get a, uh, you still have an interference pattern, of course, but that interference pattern is described, that's just the J, uh, your zero, the zero of the Bessel function, okay? So the function of the wave that you generate, the sort of the transverse beam profile that you get here, okay, looks, sort of looks like this. You just get a Bessel beam. Now, the nice feature about Bessel beams is that the, again, you don't have to go through the maths of Bessel beams. You can just do some very simple trigonometry, and you can ask yourself the, Let's redraw this over here. So I've got some intersection point between 
my two waves which are coming in, okay? Here, this is where I'll have the Bessel function, okay? And I can ask myself, at what speed is this high-intensity peak moving along this axis, okay? And the answer is, if these waves are moving in at C, then this spot here is moving, let's call it V, okay? This V is just equal to C divided by the sine of theta, where this is my angle theta, okay? So what I've got here is a really cool and simple way to control the speed at which my laser pulse is moving along the z-axis, okay? All this stuff here is relatively low intensity, so it doesn't really contribute to the nonlinearity. All I, need to, all I need to account for is the central peak, and he's moving at V divided by sine theta. And how do I control this theta? You just need to control, you need to just take different taxicons with a different angle, because that changes the angle, the angle of these plane waves. So, and this is exactly what I needed, right? I said I wanted, remember, let's go back to this graph here. I said what I want to do is I need, these are curves which are given by the material. I want to change the speed at which my light pulse is moving so that, that I can control and move shift around this interval. And then check for every given speed of my vessel beam, I want to check that I have emission only, or that I have emission in this window and only in this window. Okay? So it can be superluminal, yes. So if, you, if the angle becomes large enough, and we've got a paper on this if you're interested, we, we went and directly measured a case where even in a material, so typically you, you have a material here, right? So this would be, you'll have a refractive index. So it's not automatically superluminal. The angle has to be large enough. But yes, it can be superluminal. But that, that shouldn't worry you. I mean, if you're interested, I might have time uh, or lots of things I want to do during the tutorial. But if, if the discussion runs out and we have a little bit of additional time, during the tutorial, I can show you measurements that we've done uh, where we directly observe a wavefront crossing, moving across a wall, and we measured the superluminal speed. And when you start to do that, depending on how you measure the superluminality, you can actually see uh, time reverse when things propagate backwards in time. But the, the, the physics essentially, let me write over here, I don't want to space, but the the, I mean, just think of what happens every time you switch on the lights in the room, okay? So again, this is much more common than you might think, the superluminal speeds. You have a wall, okay? That, that wall or this wall here, and then you have a sort of a light bulb here, you switch it on, and this emits a spherical wave, okay? And so now my question is, at what speed does that spot move along the wall? Okay, and you've got an angle here, Okay, this is moving at C, and the answer is C divided by sine theta. So every time you switch the lights on, okay, you have these waves which are emitted from the light bulb, and their intersection on the wall creates like a scattering spot. If I can see the light scattered from the wall, it creates a scattering spot which moves across the wall faster than the speed of light. Okay, and it's exactly the same. If you look at the geometry, I mean, nothing's changed. It's exactly the same. Exactly, exactly, but it's the same here. The signal is not, the signal is not going from here to here, okay? The information, let me, let me draw this bigger again. And so there's no violation of causality or, or, or anything weird going on here. So let's draw a big guy like this, and then this is going to propagate, and so it's going to be, it's going to have something like this. I don't, I'm not sure if this drawing is going to, let me not draw this in a moment. Okay, so I have this point here. He's traveling at C divided by sine theta, so let's just say he's superluminal, okay? And... Let's take another point here. So the information is not going from here to here. That is not what is happening. The information from this point is coming from here and from here, okay? And these fronts are actually propagating at C, okay? 
In other words, if I go back to my axicon and say, well, how did I actually generate this information? Okay. If I want to generate information over here, then actually it has to come, or the axicon isn't big enough, but it has to come from all the way up there, and then it comes down. Whereas the information over here came from this spot. So they are, the, the, in other words, if you want to use, I think you pointed out earlier on that I had drawn my time-like uh, lines incorrectly, all these points are space-like in the Minkowski diagram, okay? They're not causally connected. They are, they're, they're all here at the same time, but different positions. So in a Minkowski diagram, they sit here, okay? They're not causally connected. So the information from this point will end up here. The information from this point will end up here, okay? So sure, I see a spot moves at faster than the speed of light, but it's not carrying information. Is that clear? Okay. But all I need from, from this, so it can still generate a nonlinearity, it can still generate a nonlinear effect, and it will still generate sort of a bump of refractive index, which is moving at C divided by sine theta, sine theta, which is what I'm interested in. Okay. So these are results of those, of those measurements. And essentially, so in this, in this first set of measurements here, so there you can see the fluorescence that we measured. It corresponds perfectly to what we found in literature. And here what we're doing, this is a set of measurements where we fix the speed so that we expected emission in this, exactly in this window here. And now we're just, what we're doing is we're just cranking up the power. Okay? And you can see that as we crank up the, the input power, this peak becomes higher, but it also becomes wider, okay? It becomes wider because this is our interpretation. As you increase the delta n, the separation between these two curves, or rather, this is fixed, and this will move towards longer wavelengths, okay? And this is exactly what you see. You see this edge is more or less fixed, and you see this edge is pushing out, okay? So... One could say, or oh, maybe there's some fluorescence that you don't know about, but fluorescence doesn't do this, okay? It doesn't have, like, one fixed edge, and then as you increase the power, you see the spectral peak shifting. The other thing that we are able to do is we are able to take these, uh, the, these emissions and from this emission predict what the delta n is. So, again, going back to here, if I know how wide my emission window is, I know what n0 is, well, then I can pull out what delta n is. And if I can pull out delta n, do I still have it written here? This is my delta n. I know what the intensity is, because that's the pulse I'm sending in, so I can pull out the n2. So you have this sanity check where you can actually verify if this is correct or not. And indeed, if we do that, so this is how the, um, the, the width is changing as you increase the power, and you just invert that formula and you pull out a value for n2, and if you go and look at Robert Boyd's book on nonlinear optics, which is kind of the Bible for nonlinear optics, this is the value that you find for a huge silica glass. So that seems a very good sort of confirmation. We have more than that. As I mentioned, we can, by changing the axicons, we can change the speed at which the laser pulse is moving. These red curves here give you the prediction for where we expect to see the emission. Okay, I'm just plotting out, as I change this curve here, I'm just plotting out how this window shifts, okay? So this bottom red curve here corresponds to delta n equals zero, and then I have different varying values of delta n all the way up to delta n equals five, ten to the minus three, okay? And what I, these are the measurements. So the, the bars here, so the vertical bar corresponds to the actual wavelength the range that we measured, the horizontal bar corresponds to the uncertainty that we had on, on the velocity, the actual speed of, uh, of the laser pulse. And you can see that this matches relatively well. Okay? Again, fluorescence, there's no other mechanism that I know of in nonlinear optics. I've been doing nonlinear optics for 20 years, and we've also asked other people. There's no mechanism that we know of in nonlinear optics that would do this kind of so our conclusion was, this is some form of, uh, of Hawking emission. 
Okay? But as I mentioned, we were not able to measure, and we can't measure in this configuration, we cannot measure correlated photon pairs. We're looking at light, which is scattered sort of randomly at 90 degrees, and that's going to ruin, you're going to completely lose all trace of, of correlation. Okay, so that's the last few minutes, I just wanted to sort of um, conclude with a couple of fancy ideas. So one thing you can try to do, for example, not only with optics, but with any, any analog model, and indeed one of the nature physics papers that I mentioned by Jess Steinhauer, I'll bring that up in a second, talks about this, oh, it's cut, uh, what, is this, what is called this black hole laser, okay? So you have an amplifier, and this idea of the black hole laser was uh, uh, proposed the first time by Ted Jacobson, okay, a while back, and essentially pointed out that if you get your horizons in, in the right order, then you, know, you can't get out, so you generate some radiation, these negative frequency modes at the black hole horizon get trapped inside, and then the white hole horizon will bounce them back. But when it bounces them back, you'll have, again, mode conversion, and you'll have another amplification process, okay? Both the black hole and the white hole amplify. And so essentially the negative, so every time it bounces back, yeah, I didn't draw them here, but you have some positive modes which come out here, but the negative modes sort of gets trapped between these two horizons never escape. And it keeps on bouncing back and forth. And every time it hits, I mean, you need to think of this horizon as like an amplifying mirror. So it, it reflects and amplifies at the same time. And so you have this continuous reflection back and forth, and every time you reflect, you amplify the light that's trapped inside. Light or phonons or whatever, whatever kind of uh, particles or waves you're looking at. Okay. So in the case of, uh, you know, we have a paper this submitted, but it's actually accepted. So, uh, we, we have a paper where we showed how to do this with, with an optical analog. This was in um, sort of just numerical simulations. But in the meantime, people have been doing uh, experiments where, although they don't directly refer to this black hole laser effect, where they have pairs of solitons which are moving in a fiber, and you have light bouncing back and forth between the two solitons. So that's a good place to go and look for this kind of amplitude. Effect. Okay, and you can do this in two different cases depending, I don't want to go into the details, but depending on the sign of the dispersion that you have. So if, you're, if you want to work with solitons, you have to be in what is called negative, in the negative uh, group velocity dispersion regime. And so you either need something like this, something that has a negative delta N, or you need to get two, two positive solitons, positive uh, amplitude solitons, so that you have a white hole on the trailing edge and a black hole on the, on the front edge, and then it will bounce back and forth. And I think I have a numerical simulation. So here you see a case where, just for simplicity, I just took uh, a hole, a negative delta n, and we'll be moving now. Although, so this was, this is a, uh, I'm solving Maxwell's equations using uh, an FEDD uh, algorithm. So it's just the Maxwell's equations which have been discretized. And what I've done is the plot here is, of course, the pulse is moving at C, but I put myself in the reference frame of the laser pulse, okay? And then I put in an initial seed. So this is classical. There's nothing quantum here. Again, remember what I mentioned earlier on about the physical process itself being classical. And let's just look at how this wave evolves over time. Oh, listen to the sound as well. Okay, so it's... Converts to high frequency, then hits here, reconverts back. But you can see that every bounce, look at this, it's been up by these high frequency components are being amplified. Okay, so that sound there was just reproducing. I have time? Let's, let's hear that again. It won't let me. Look at the, the mode conversion every time you bounce back and forth. But you see this high frequency part, which keeps on building up at each bounce. Okay, until finally at the end, what, what, so that, that sort of high frequency noise and weight that you could see there is essentially the negative frequency mode building up over time. Okay, so I'm nearly done. Uh, 
Um, just a minute, why won't it let me? Okay, what's going on? So, not necessarily. I just, uh, uh, you, you can do it with either, but you just need to be careful. Who's asking the question? Sorry. Uh, so, you, you don't have to do it with negative GVD, you can do it with positive. But I'd say negative GVD is probably better because what you want is, in order to see this lasing effect, you want your uh, black and white hole horizon to, to remain constant. You don't want them changing over time. In normal GVD, the pulses will suffer from dispersion and will just broaden out. So that's why, yes. So if you have two solitons propagating the negative GVD regime and you trap light in between, that will work. No, no, you can have the posit positive, you either have a, 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 a negative delta N with just a hole, or you have two positive delta N humps. But the two positive delta N humps are, are your solid. Okay? Okay, so I think I'm done. I just want to point out again uh, some background reading if you want to look into this in more detail. Uh, this paper here starts from first principles and describes everything and considers all possible uh, systems in which you can study analog gravity. These are the two nature physics papers cut, unfortunately, but if you just look up uh, Jeff Steinhauer's name, uh, nature physics, you'll find these two papers. This is the first one, okay? He's talking of self-amplifying Hawking radiation. He had something similar to this black hole laser system that I showed you, okay? He had some, like two horizons in his, his BC, and here there was, uh, he repeated the experiment uh, and published just August this year where he, he was more careful in his horizon arrangement, had a single horizon, and claims to have measured um, in actual entanglement. So I mentioned, so I, I said that for the smoking guns, you want to also observe entanglement uh, in order to claim that you really have generated this, this radiation. And, well, you've already seen these. Oh, I won't bother going again, so I'll leave this. Thank you. So any other question? The, so the amplification, so the, the physical origin of the amplification is the system itself. So uh, in the case of the black hole, astrophysical black holes, if you, if you were able to generate something like that, you, it would be the mass of the black holes. If you're generating it with solitons, it's the solitons that would be losing energy. So you're taking energy, light from the solitons and feeding it into this light that's trapped in the middle. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, in optics, that's, that's, that, that's not a big mystery. I mean, there, there are tens of ways in which you can you transfer. And this is the whole process at the basis of amplification. If you want some, you, four wave mixing does exactly that. You have an intense beam that transfers light to a, to a weak beam. Uh, in the BC, it's going to be the energy of the BC itself, uh, or phonon oscillations in the BC that give, provide energy to the vacuum fluctuations and then come in out. Does that answer your question? So that's what you need to be careful of. You, so there's no Chi 2 here. There's no second harmonic. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't change as you change the speed of your pulse. So we have a series of checks. So you said. Uh, no, so my experiments were all in positive GVD. But, but, but we know what the GVD is, and that's fixed. That's not changing, okay? So I'm always pumping at the same wavelength. I was pumping at, eight, uh, at 800 nanometers. So the material, the GVD is a property of the material. It's not changing, so I'm not changing the wavelength. And so the sanity checks, the first one was to verify that as we increase the power, that we could, we could recover the fact that the, the nonlinearity was due to the chi-3 because we were able to measure the N2, and it's exactly what you find on what is the accepted value for the N2 of these silica graphs. So that's sort of like the first sanity check that this is a chi-3 effect. So, but it, it wouldn't be chi-2, right? So we're pumping... 
so, but, so in, the, in this measurement, we, in this case, we were pumping, we had the neodymium blast laser, and we were pumping at one micron. So, well, 1.050 uh, micron. So, I mean, there's no way that with a CHI-2 you can get to these kind of wavelengths. So you can immediately exclude that. And you can also exclude any kind of four-wave mixing effects because if you have a peak here, then if this is the signal, you should expect an idler at, at a corresponding wavelength from the other on the long wavelength side, which we didn't. So you, you can exclude all these other processes. I, I, you have to be careful, of course. I, I, I get your point. You're absolutely right. You, know, you see a tiny peak. And I mean, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, this, this, although it looks like a relatively large signal, I mean, if, you, if you read off the counts here, we've got tens of photoelectron counts. But this was over hours of measurement. I mean, we were essentially detecting something which is of the order of 10 to the minus 2. So one photon every, uh, every 100 laser pulses. So clearly, when you're detecting something so weak, you have to be careful that it, it could be some you know, higher order effects of chi-7, some weird chi-3 wave mixing or whatever. And so we did go through that, and we weren't able to explain, explain it in any other way. But I guess the important, the, the, what was convincing us was that we were able, we expect a linear dependence of the delta n with intensity, and that's exactly what we found. And from the slope, we were able to pull out exactly what the value of, uh, of the n2 is. And so that gave us further sort of indications that this probably is. Sure, I mean, but, uh, I, I, you, you can give a name to anything and then just generalize it so much that you include everything, right? So here we were looking from the side, but you know, I mean, people can assign any meaning they want to words. And, and then we, we can sit down and fight out what we mean about words. And there was a, a huge discussion after we published this paper. It was one of the first experimental papers actually showing that it's, it is worthwhile doing. I mean, up until 2010, it was pure theory. Hardly any experiments at all, aside from a couple of experiments by Joe Mandelson in, in water. And, and then, you know, you come along and you say, oh, I've seen Hawking radiation. Everyone went ballistic. Probably rightly so, because then there was a big battle over, okay, what do we mean by, by Hawking radiation? Okay? And, and that discussion is still going on six years later. And, and the question is because the answer is subtle, and it depends on the system. And do you, are you willing to accept the dispersion caused by the black hole dispersion? Now, Cherenkov radiation. I mean, let's define what we mean by Cherenkov radiation. Cherenkov radiation means I have uh, something which is moving a bit faster than it should do, so the C divided by N sine theta, and I see some form of emission, and that's all you want to go with, fine, call it, we, should, we can call it Cherenkov radiation. But let's remember, I mean, they, they, people got a Nobel Prize for Cherenkov radiation. It has a meaning, and, and it's a well-studied effect. In order to see Cherenkov radiation, you have to have, if it's, if it's a neutral medium, so there's no natural dipolar orientation, as there is not in in a chi-3 medium, a symmetric medium, okay, all the dipoles have the random orientation, then you have to have a charged particle. Cherenkov radiation is the emission. This is the very first thing I said yesterday. Cherenkov emission is the emission from the fact that all these dipoles are reorient, get reorientation kick. But it, you need a charged particle to do that. The plasma's not moving. So sure, I generate in the wake of the, of the, of the laser pulse, I generate a plasma, but it's not going anywhere. It's certainly not traveling at, at uh, C over sine theta. Are you talking transverse or, or longitudinal now? But, 
Okay, so I would, so there's a bit of confusion. So I think that is what we did do, and that's that graph there. We changed the speed and showed that the emission wavelength changes. So we'll come to that, but if you can show me a physical mechanism in nonlinear optics that does that, I'd be very interested. I, I don't think there exists anything in any nonlinear optics book or paper that does that. Coming back to your question, so, so I think, so we did try to do that. We did try to look for something. So what is it that cannot be found in nonlinear optics that will, can be found here? And I, that's what we did there. Now, coming to your question, what you need to change is, uh, so the temperature is proportional to the dn in dx, but the x here, it's not, let me use z. It's not the transverse direction. It's the longitudinal direction. It's, the, it's I have a 1D uh, black hole along my direction of propagation. So the waves try to approach it from behind and then get reflected. Okay, so it's the, it's the longitudinal shape that I want to change. That's really hard, um, especially in dispersive medium. I mean, you can try fiddling around a little bit. But my guess is that you'll only be able to make things worse. It'd be difficult to create a very sharp transition in a few parallel lines. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good question. So the I mentioned earlier on that you should let me write down the names. You should look for papers by these two guys, Belgiorno and Cacciatori. Um, but there are also papers by Caruzotto. So. What these, these two guys did for the first time is they tried to do exactly what you said. The, the, so one of the, I didn't talk about this. There's a big unhidden hidden problem here. And that hidden problem, which I didn't mention, is that I wrote out a metric, okay? So this, uh, or I wrote out a wave equation, which was dispersionless. And, and from that, I pulled out a metric, which you're allowed to do if there's no dispersion, because N, doesn't depend on frequency, meaning that it also does not depend on time. In time in sense of the, the lab frame coordinate time. But, and then at the end, at some point, I just took a graph and I said, oh, look what happens if you have dispersion. But you're not, not really allowed to do that. It's, it's, it's kind of coming in from the back door and, and, and hiding everything under the carpet. Um, so, and the problem is you can't write a metric for time dependence with time dependent coefficient just can't do that. So what these guys did, you need to go back to, if you want to really analyze people's struggles from theoreticians struggled for years over this, then they came up with the idea to use what is called this Hopfield model, where you have two coupled equations. One is for the quantized electromagnetic field, and one is for the quantized medium. So you treat the medium as a set of quantized harmonic oscillators, and then you just tune the strength and the damping of the oscillators so that you can match the actual material dispersion. And then you solve those two equations, okay? So those were the first guys to do this. There is actually Unruh himself has got interested in this question. And he, just a few months ago, put a paper on the archive where he's using a modified version again, but it's this Hopfield model. If you go and look at his re most recent paper on the archive, you'll see these two coupled equations. And, and then moving forward from, from there and then Again, essentially what you end up with though, at the end is you end up sort of trying to calculate these beta coefficients and trying to make sure that the ratio between alpha and beta has this negative exponential dependence on what the black body. But that is how you, do, how you solve this problem from first principles. And the conclusion is it works. Now that was, yeah. It came a few years after the experiments, but the good news is that it works. Thank you. Just thanks, Professor, for this wonderful talk. Thank you.